Good morning. This is going to be, this is now Bridge to a Better World, but right now it's the prelude and we have our drinky bird and our we're, carnival. We're preluding. Yep. Ludes later. Not the best view of it. Oh. Will the bird hit the planes? Yes. Been a bird strike. Captain Sully, where are you? Hmm. I think I put the bird out of the range of things. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. I know. Well, it's the price of aviation fuel, you know. Good morning back at you, Jabara. All right, we'll just move Drinky Bird here. You can drink over there. He was only drinking some air anyway. He's been teetotaling. It's so sad. I know. I'm kind of sad for Drinky. I'll have to get him some proper whiskey. That would be good. All right, Nick, I'm going to squeeze carry, over this one. Carry on. I think I'm here. Okay. All I right. am I am the off, off screen. Off screen. Voice. All right. This is now Bridge to a Better World. That's the name of this program. I'm Teresa Mitchell, and off screen is Ani, who has COVID and uh, who uh, will be well, coming recover, back a little I'm later in. She's, she's recovering from COVID. And uh, mm -hmm. she will uh, have some tarot insights for you a little later on. Uh, I have a theme for today's program, which is uh, three corporate lies that keep us down. Uh, but first, uh, some headlines. Uh, perhaps you heard that uh, uh, Putin is threatening with nuclear weapons again. Uh, it's hard to say how seriously to take that, uh, especially considering that uh, Ukraine is farming territory. And if he starts using little nukes to get his way on the battlefield, well, those are going to be some pretty hot rutabagas for a while, uh, even if nothing else happens. And of course, the whole problem is a whole lot of something else might happen, including nuclear Armageddon. So we can all just worry about that, I guess. Um, there have been <laughs> direct efforts over the decades to stop 
uh, the threat of nuclear war. And we used to have a thing called the Strategic Arms Nuclear uh, Treaty. We, let's, let's see, I believe that's what it was called. Start. It's called the START Treaty anyway. So it can be done, and it's time to do it again, obviously. Uh, as the sun rises red over Portland, Oregon's U.S. Senators Jeff Merkley and, Je and Ron Wyden announced on Wednesday the 29th that $6.8 million in bipartisan infrastructure law will fund for wildfire prevention projects in Oregon. And I was really glad to see that because there really needs to be uh, some efforts in place on the ground ready for the fires that are going to keep happening. Uh, this is from an article from KPIC4 News from last week. The funding will cover 49,000 acres of lake, or, uh, excuse me, of land across the state. Merkley and Wyden's offices say the additional funding has helped to complete fuels treatments on nearly 2 million acres nationwide uh, this fiscal year, a substantial increase over the last year's fiscal year. Now, fuels treatment is not uh, the treatment that I would prefer. I'd rather they just get out there with some uh, tanks of water. But uh, as, uh, as Oregon's wildfire seasons grow longer and hotter, they are a stark reminder of how important resilient forests are to protecting our communities, said Merkley. This funding will support new and existing projects intended to help thin Oregon's overgrown forests, support better ecosystems, reduce the threat of severe wildfires, and create more jobs. And uh, of course, this is uh, double speak for we're going to go out there and log some more. Thin which, overgrown. Yes, forest. which is going to make the uh, ground hotter and uh, make fires worse. The fact is, uh, there was a time when this country was covered uh, with old growth from sea to shining sea. And uh, the fires were limited by the fact but that the trees created so much shade that the overgrowth, the uh, undergrowth it is, was not substantial uh, enough to cause very many hot fires. And the fires are actually a part of a healthy forest uh, cycle. I hear a voice. <laughs> Sorry, I'll the, just go back over here. <laughs> the fires are. Ready. And in fact, the fires are a part of a, a natural cycle. But uh, we've screwed that up and we have, a, uh, we have tree farms now instead of forests. And uh, so this is uh, pretty close to a waste of money. But uh, if they get out there and get ready for fires, I suppose that's a good part of it. That's a good thing. Anyway, uh, moving on. Part of Biden's statement yesterday, in case you missed it, speaking of lighting things up. Uh, no one should be in jail, he said, just for using or possessing marijuana. Sending people to prison for possessing marijuana has upended too many lives and incarcerated people for poor conduct that many states no longer prohibit Criminal records for marijuana possession have also imposed needless barriers to employment, housing, and educational opportunities. And while white and black and brown people use marijuana at similar rates, black and brown people have been arrested, prosecuted, and convicted at disproportionate rates. And what I want to say, of course, is the things that he doesn't say, and that is that the war on drugs was also a war on dissent. It was a war on Vietnam dissenters particularly, but it extended to dissenters against the uh, war in Central America, and uh, I remember one of my friends did years for having a small amount of marijuana. Anyway, uh, Biden announced that he uh, had three steps that he's taking to end this failed approach. First, he said, I am announcing a pardon of all prior federal offenses of simple possession of marijuana. Second, he said, I am urging all governors to do the same with regard to state offenses. Now, that second uh, part means absolutely fucking nothing. Uh, the third part, he said, federal law currently classifies marijuana in Schedule One of the Controlled Schedule uh, Substances Act. The classification meant for the most dangerous substances. This is the same as for heroin and LSD and even higher than the classification of fentanyl and methamphetamine, the drugs that are driving our overdose epidemic. And on that third part, he didn't do anything substantial either. He just said, maybe it'd be a good idea to change that. So hey, I'm just going to butt in. Please butt in and welcome back. COVID cannot stop, honey. Um, <laughs> though it can try. Uh, and, and words. Words are not really my friend this week. So that's why Teresa's doing all the talking, and I'm just doing some button pushing by and large. But I just wanted to say it's not nothing that, that the president actually called on each governor to um, you know, do the right thing by uh, expunging convictions and um, you know, freeing all all pot prisoners, period. Um, 
I get that he has no direct power over it. And I get that there's a whole lot of dumbass governors that aren't going to actually even consider it. And this is going to be fodder for, you know, them calling Biden. I don't even know what. Because uh, that's just politics right now. But it's not for nothing that the president actually had those words come out of his mouth. I'm just, I, I, I put it out there because as a 57 year old pothead, I never thought I'd hear a president say that. I see where you're going with that. Well, um, and <laughs> I I'll, I'll, I'll see that and, and raise you a, <laughs> uh, he could have said, I have gathered with my colleagues in the Senate to introduce a bill that will make oh, he could have done of marijuana federally legal. For um, sure. No, no, no. He could have done way better. Yeah. But it's not for nothing. Okay. Not for quite exactly nothing. Okay. Um, so now, uh, I would Sorry. also note Sorry, that, <laughs> despite he, um, despite the fact that he did note that it has been used to attack black people, and it yeah. certainly has, and primarily, and that was the idea, uh, he has provided absolutely no provision, nor even a suggestion to the governors for reparations. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'd like to move to, this is going to be a shorter show, by the way. Um <laughs> Stamina, this, you say? This is now a bridge to a better world. <laughs> and uh, well, 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 we're uh, mentioning that you are watching. This is now bridge to a better world. <laughs> um, you could go ahead, hit the like button, subscribe, let your friends know. You know, stuff. You do that. Hit the alert bell thing. Um, back to Teresa. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that Joe Barra says uh, Idaho is still and, arresting people for pot and other states. Yeah, and it's good true. Morgan back to you, John. Um, now I want to talk about uh, three nice little frauds that corporations like to pull on us. They're certainly not the only frauds, but uh, first there's the climate capture fraud. It just captured my attention because it is such BS. An analysis published this week shows that the past congressional efforts to bolster fossil fuel industry backs carbon capture schemes have amounted to a little more than a sinkhole of taxpayer money. A pertinent warning as Congress moves once again to pump billions of dollars into the failed technology as the climate crisis intensifies. Now that is the writing in commondreams.org, uh, an organization that I urge you to support and to, and to read, commondreams.org. Uh, and that says it pretty straight, I think. Uh, billions of dollars into the failed technology. And I would add the can't possibly work uh, is there to fool you technology. Um, they write as a cautionary tale, the report from the Food and Water Watch points to the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, a stimulus package that put forth $3.4 billion for the research and development of carbon capture and storage, CCS projects. The results weren't exactly encouraging. Food and Water Watch notes that, quote, out of 11 large-scale demonstration projects selected by the Department of Energy, the DOE, nine were funded by the ARRA and only two remain operational. Of five commercial power plants, the analysis shows only one, Petronova, ever reached operation. And Petronova faced serious challenges, forcing the plant to close after fewer than four years, in quotes. And one of those, speaking for myself, one of those challenges was it didn't work. Uh, Food and Water Watch says, quote, this track record should elicit serious concern, in quote, given that the recently approved Inflation Reduction Act increases federal tax credits for CCS technology, putting even more public dollars on the line for a technology with a failed track record. Here again, I want to pop in and say, um, it's supposed to have a fa uh, failed track record. It's not there uh, to actually remove carbon from the air. That is physically impossible on the scale that is physically possible. It is there to make you think that Exxon, BP, Chevron, and the lot are doing something about climate change. They aren't. They won't. Something. What do we want? Something. Something, something to look at. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, a law crafted in part by top big oil ally Senator Joe Manchin, also greenlights $2.1 billion in loans and grants for a new CCS infrastructure, which fossil fuel companies have embraced in what environmentalists say is a cynical ploy to stave off effective climate action. It's the sort of thing that, I mean, when they start throwing away billions of dollars for bullshit projects, 
Isn't it tempting to come up with your own bullshit project? And then you could divert the funds to lefty causes. That would be interesting. You know, I could uh, do carbon capture by raising hemp and then freezing it forever in the Antarctic. Um, <laughs> returning to uh, oh, the script here. What, <laughs> I captured some carbon. What uh, the fossil fuel industry hopes you won't find out, Food and Water Watch declared, is, quote, carbon capture is already a failure of an experiment funded with taxpayer money, end quote. In a press release, Food and Water Watch concisely summarized carbon capture's records, quote, billions of wasted dollars, end quote. And here again, I just got to pop in and say it wasn't really quite wasted. It it worked in the way that it was intended to dog please do not pull down my backdrop <laughs> dog dog sorry <laughs> okay so that's uh that's a fraud and uh let's talk about a second you fraud just remember when it comes to their wealth your money is no object yeah your money is no object when it comes to fooling you anyway uh, and this is one that people just don't like to think about. Um, I get more pushback on this over the years than, well, it, it's one of the top pushback things. People don't want to think that this is true, but the fact is plastic recycling is a fraud, period. Yes. All that recycling you did went to the landfill. It went to, or it went to a separate ravine. Uh, near Boardman. <laughs> That's the extent of the plastic recycling that is happening. Uh, Lara Liebrick, this is from NPR, by the way, a manager at Rogue Disposal and Recycling in Southern Oregon, is standing on the end of its landfill watching an avalanche of plastic trash pour out of a semi-trailer, containers, bags, packages, strawberry containers, yogurt cups. This is from a couple years ago. None of this plastic will be turned into new plastic things. All of it is buried. Uh, she said, quote, to me, that that felt like it was a betrayal of the public, public trust. I had been lying to people unwittingly, end quote. Rogue, like most recycling companies, had been sending plastic trash to China. But when China shut its doors two years ago, and by the way, uh, let me pop in here, uh, because the U.S. was a complete political asshole to China, <laughs> and it was an act of retaliation. Uh, Liebrich scoured the U.S. for buyers. She could only find someone who wanted white milk jugs. She sends the soda bottles to the state. But when Liebrich tried to tell people the truth about burying all of the other plastics, she says people didn't want to hear it. She's quoted saying, I remember the first meeting when I actually told a city council it was costing more to recycle than it was to dispose of the same material as garbage. And uh, speaking for myself, they do dispose of the same material as garbage. It just goes in a different ravine. There's no difference. Uh, she said, and it was like heresy had been spoken in the room. You're lying. This is gold. We take time to clean it, take the labels off, separate it, and put it here. It's gold. This is valuable, end quote. Gold! But, but it's not valuable. And it never, oh boy, I'm just swimming all over the place here. <laughs> I have this thing. <laughs> okay, please uh, say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not particularly elegant this morning. It's okay. Uh, um, just survive. This is all I require of you. Well, you know, so I think in the best case scenario, we're just burying the shit, right? That's what's going on. Uh, in the best case scenario, because otherwise we're actually recycling the shit. And the problem with plastics recycling is that it's full of plastics. And plastics are toxic. And uh, just, wow, I'm drinking Brutus cast in this crazy shadow and it's kind of making me dizzy. Can you can you right, move oh. Drinky Bird a little bit? I knew that Kate and Drinky Bird was so capable. I'm I'm uh, able to make myself dizzy at ten paces. All right. Anyway, um, I just I point out there's a recent uh, report by Human Rights Watch uh, from Turkey, and but when I say recent, I mean like uh, in September of this year. So um, just to summarize uh, the first little bit. Uh, Ali, who is a man in his mid-20s, started working at a plastic recycling plant in Adana, a city in the south of Turkey, when he was 13. He worked 13 hours a day in a recycling facility, shorting, sh sorting, shredding, and melting plastic into small pellets. Five years ago, Ali quit his job because he had trouble breathing, and then he thought it was linked to air pollution at the recycling facility, where there's always a strong smell of gas. Um, Plastic products contain toxic chemical additives that cause serious health problems. 
Plastic recycling releases those toxins into the local environment, threatening the health of those working in the industry and living in nearby recycling facilities. And it does go on and on. And I remember in the 90s, Helen Caldicott uh, had a book out called If You Dearly Love This Planet. And um, she talked about the uh, recycling of plastics actually creating more toxins than the manufacture of virgin plastics. And so I've always, you know, I've always been a little bit of a heretic when it comes to um, my, my recycling. I, I do not prioritize recycling plastic. It is a scam. And the only thing to really do to save us is to quit making plastics. So, you know, to use glass as much as possible, to get rid of single-use plastics, and to try, you know, to as much as possible uh, uh, step away from that abyss because it's just full of lies like you are saying well yeah and you, you can try to do that and uh people do try and they do and, yeah. remove labels and the fact is it's all it's, it's simply pr yeah um it has no effect no effect and uh if you're worrying about whether you got the right uh plastic into the container or whether you put garbage into a recycling container it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, another reason, aside from the fact that, you know, I mean, at least uh, in Turkey, they're trying to put it in little plastic pellets. They're not doing that here. They're just cramming it into a dead ravine. And uh, when I say a dead ravine, I mean a dead end ravine in which it doesn't drain to a stream. At least it better not. <laughs> I haven't checked on that, I have to admit. But uh, there are there are plenty of ravines like that out near Boardman. They are vast. Uh, they can take hundreds of years of our trash, and they will. Um, someday they will be mined, I'm sure, by people who are wearing very special, uh, very tough suits, possibly also made of plastic, uh, but uh, not now. And also, when you uh, when you recycle plastic, you've taken a certain amount of the snap out of it, so to speak, and uh, you can only do that so much. You can't just keep recycling plastic the way the industry would like you uh, to believe. It's not as high grade. It doesn't do the job as well. Uh, it doesn't sell uh, to corporations uh, who want an efficiently uh, packaged product. And the only way to get rid of it is the same way we got rid of tetraethyl lead. Tetraethyl lead uh, reduced the population IQ. I'm not kidding about this. Reduced the population IQ of the United States from the 1950s to the 1980s by 2.6%. And it wasn't stopped by people saying, oh, I guess I won't use leaded gas. It was stopped because a congressional law said there shall be no more leaded gas. And we need a we need Congress to step up. You know, not that they work for us, but, you know, sometimes we can frighten or coerce them into actually acting for us. <laughs> and uh, we need a law that says single use plastics simply will no longer be produced. That's it. Feeny back to waxed paper. I don't care. It has to stop. So don't worry about recycling because it's bullshit. So, and let me just add to this. Uh, this is from Greenpeace. Here's the basic problem. All used plastic can be turned into new things, but picking it up, sorting it out, and melting it down is expensive. Plastic also degrades each time it is reused, meaning it can't be reused more than once or twice. In other words, new plastic is cheap, it's made from oil and gas, and it's almost always less expensive and of better quality just to start fresh. All of these problems have existed for decades, and uh, the uh, article just goes on more to uh, point out how we have all been bamboozled about that for decades. Part of it is the litter myth. Remember the, uh, if you're old enough, maybe, or if you've seen the uh, documentary footage, maybe you've seen the uh, famous commercial in which... Um, an Italian man uh, posing as uh, a stereotypical Indian uh, sheds a tear at the uh, littering of the landscape. The problem there is not the fact that people toss their bottles into the stream. The problem is that the manufacturers make throwaway products and fight like hell against uh, having to uh, reuse them like a Coke bottle. So documents show that industry officials... Uh, have been doing this stuff since the 70s. Many of the industry's old documents are housed in libraries, and uh, they have a report for, in them, for example, written in April 1973 by scientists tasked, by for, tasked with forecasting possible uses for top industry executives. 
Recycling plastic, it told the executives, was unlikely to happen on a broad scale. There is no recovery from obsolete products, it says. So, um, uh, concluding, for more than half a century, the plastic industry has engaged in an aggressive campaign to deceive the public, perpetuating the myth, perpetuating a myth that recycling can solve the plastics crisis. The truth is, the vast majority of the plastic cannot be recycled. In quote. So this is just like BP and Chevron and the lot telling you that you have a carbon footprint and you need to do something about it. You need to act better because it's your bad acting that is mm-hmm. destroying the environment. It is not. It's big corporations. Big corporations need big solutions. They need big Congress and a great big tank with a great big gun on it, maybe, to make them stop what they're doing. We're going to have to act collectively. We're going to have to act decisively because... You know, taking the blame on ourselves can't ever work. So this, that's uh, that's just one of the ways. Uh, that's two of the ways now <laughs> that corporations are oppressing you while making you feel bad about it. And uh, the third one that I chose for this week is the fact that the Fed is attacking your family. Now, if you're like half of Americans, at least, uh, you're worried that you really just haven't gotten it together and that you really should have made better grades and made better choices, and darn it, this precarity that you're living in is your own fault, well, it ain't. An analysis published Tuesday shows that top executives of the largest corporations in the United States have seen their pay soar by 1,500% over the past 43 years, helping to fuel a massive surge in inequality as workers' wages lag. This is by Jake Johnson. Uh, Between 78 and 2021, according to... uh, New research from Economic Policy Institute, CEO compensation at the 350 largest publicly traded U.S. companies rose by an inflation-adjusted 1,460%, far outstripping the 18.1% increase that the nation's typical worker saw during that period. Now, uh, speaking for myself, how did that happen? Uh, How did that happen? The way it happened is technology. Technology got better and better, more and more efficient. Computers did more and more of the work. We have artificial intelligence selecting algorithms that allow us to know where to put things most efficiently. We have just-in-time distribution of groceries. Uh, We are far more technologically advanced. This produced a great deal more money. That's when they say productivity. They mean it made a lot of money. It made a whole lot of money. It made a giant amount of money, which was stripped from the workers uh, the the classic example is the cotton gin. The cotton gin didn't end slavery. The cotton gin made slavery more profitable. Slaves were used to operate cotton gins. Uh, the cotton gin myth is one of those things that is used to keep you in place. The fact is you have the right to the wealth that you, you produce. That's what makes me a Marxist. That's why I'm a little C commie. I'm telling you the truth that uh, the capitalist is simply a parasite. A lot of people think, oh, the capitalist is a necessary administrator. No, an administrator is an administrator. A capitalist just sucks money. Perfect example of this would be a woman born into the Walton family, uh, was born with billions of dollars, has run over people um, and gotten away with it, with her car, gotten drunk, gotten her car, run people down, killed them, got away with it always had billions, always will have billions, hasn't earned one penny of it ever because capitalism. The uh, trend of soaring CEO pay, Jake Johnson writes, has continued during the coronavirus epidemic, which caused mass economic chaos and job loss among ordinary workers. EPI found that while millions lost jobs in the first year of the pandemic and suffered real wage declines during to inflation in the second year, CEOs realized compensation jumped to 30.3% between 2019 and 2021, typical worker compensation among those who remained employed rose 3.9 over the same time span. So we're talking about the pandemic. Pandemic's the problem, right? People are demanding too much money. Wages are too high. No, that's a lie. CEOs got 10 times as much. Workers got 3.9%. CEOs got 30.3%. So this is just a a common public lie, and it is put forward by uh, organizations that are funded by by corporations to keep you in the dark. 
Federal Reserve Chair Jeremy Powell, the world's most powerful central banker, has been forthright about the primary goals of his rate hikes, a, work, a weaker labor market and lower wages. That means you. He is busting your ability to take home the bacon. And he's doing it on behalf of rich people. According to the Fed's own projections, rate increases could throw about 1.5 million people in the U.S. out of work by the end of next year. What we hope to achieve is a period of growth below trend, he says, which will cause the labor market to get back into better balance. And that will bring wages back down to levels that are more consistent with a 2% inflation over time. Did you fall asleep yet? Because that's the way they talk. When they, what they mean to say is, we need to beat down workers so we can suck more money out of them. That is what he is saying. And I bet if he said that, it would get your attention. <laughs> it is more exciting, though. Yeah, <laughs> and it's also more accurate. Mm -hmm. When Powell voices his desire to get wages down, as he did during a May press conference, he's not referring to the skyrocketing pay of top corporate executives or Wall Street bankers who have seen their bonuses surge by 1,700% since 1985. As the Lever's Matthew Cunningham Cook reported earlier this year, the Powell's Fed has declined to implement a law to reduce the skyrocketing paychecks of his former colleagues on Wall Street. In this case, it really is a zero-sum game. There's a certain amount of money that's been produced by the workers. It's been sucked into the elite class. And that has caused, this is why people are living on the street in tents. The fact is, even people who can't work, have never been able to work in a functioning economy, will get some handouts from their ma and pa. That's how that works. That's how that always works. It's how it works in countries where they're not as crazy about capitalism as the U.S. is. But can't get that. Uh, we're all supposed to be proper consumers and blame ourselves for not having a penny and make sure that no one has a penny in order to in order to uh, keep them desperately, you know, seeking that, you know, that tin can that they can turn in for 10 cents. Uh, this is cruelty that we submit to. Uh, I often say that uh, these are greedy and cruel bastards at the top who do this and uh, think that they deserve it. And that's true. But it's also true, uh, even though we have been conditioned to this point and can scarcely be blamed for it, it is also true that we submit, we obey. Why? I'm here to ask you why. Enforcement? Yes, enforcement, but there are not enough cops to stop us from having a socialist society. That's the fact. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what uh, the cops would never want to get out. If we decide on a socialist society, there are are not enough cops to stop us ever. A socialist society where, in fact, we just create infrastructure that, you know, builds a compassionate base of support for the least of us. Yes, and feed hungry kitties, too. Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> Very hungry kitties. Okay, so um, I had more on CEO pay and that sort of thing, but uh, it was yelling about the uh, parasitism that was the point. Uh, and that's what made me very happy. Thank you for letting me rant. I'm done now. And uh, I would uh, like to ask my colleague, Ani, and my uh, Hello. lifelong partner <laughs> to give us some uh, true based insights. That's not quite your this whole life. Doings. The better part of my life. Thanks. That's a pretty good answer, huh? That's a really good answer. Yeah. It's half my life. Wow. I know child bride I was. Okay. Look, I've got two real cards. Pick a card. Um, so this week, you know, when I woke up this morning and um, there was news of looming nuclear war and this area has just had a little tiny earthquake and things seem kind of bad overall, but I... I had just a scooch more energy than I've had over the last week and heck took a shower and stuff. I don't know. It was, it was kind of a good morning balanced with the threat of nuclear annihilation. And so that's basically the reading in a nutshell that I bring to you. Um, over this next week, we have to really look at uh, being overwhelmed. We can easily be overwhelmed with uh, currents of energy. Um, there's, there's a very active uh, sort of energy and it's swirly right now. It's not very grounded. It can go in any direction and it's likely to bring a lot of conflict. I know they look cute. 
but it's full of conflict. Um, this is the Five of Wands, which is about, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of energy. It can be used for good or for ill, but chances are good um, that there's going to be some power struggle involved. Um, there's going to be some butting of heads. There's going to be some positioning. And so just so, sort of make sure that you are taking care of yourself and taking care of those around you. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of, of headbutting energy going on this week. Um, so the Ace of Wands is, again, all about that uh, creative flow, um, a lot of uh, energy in the system, um, but it doesn't make for an easy time necessarily. Uh, there are ways to work with it, but maybe overall you just kind of want to uh, make sure that it's not piling on you, right? Um, I don't want to say duck and cover. I don't think we're quite up to the duck and cover stage, especially, you know, literally in the nukes and stuff. But I am saying... Speaking of bullshit campaigns, <laughs> is it ducking a cover and keep you from I being know, roasted? right? Still, let's really... Not, let's not diverge. Um, walk. Let's see. So, it, but, it, but it is a time to really kind of conserve your energy and uh, make sure that you're not being sort of let off um, on wild goose chases of your own making or of uh, the making of those around you who, you know, aren't looking to conserve your energy. Conserve your energy. That's what I'm saying. And ultimately, your ally this week, look for uh, really recharging with some of the, uh, the wonderful, uh, rather out of season, uh, sunnier days ahead this week. Um, really do pull in that solar charge because uh, we're going to need it. Uh, we are heading into the dark time of the year um, and things are, are um, unsure. Things are uh, a bit precarious. And so um, hunker down a bit, conserve your energy, um, keep your eye on unnecessary conflict um, and acting kindness always. Remember to recharge when you can. All right, then. And that's what I got. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, our love goes out to you and to all the ships at sea. See you next week. Woo! Bye bye. Now. <laughs>